Wednesday, and let's get started. Good to see you all out tonight. Stand with me, number 269. We're going to start with a couple of choruses, just one time through each. Number 269, I just keep trusting my Lord. 269.
joy to know that our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. And good to see you back tonight in the Lord's house. Thank you for making the effort to be here and to being faithful to God's house. Let's bow forward to prayer and we'll ask the Lord to bless as we continue the services. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for an opportunity, Lord, to be back in your house again tonight. And uh, Lord, I pray that you might bless our meeting. And uh, Lord, I pray that you might be the center of it. And uh, Lord, I pray that you might be the, the unseen, uh, invited guest. And uh, Lord, as we consider your presence tonight, uh, may we be yielded to what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And once again, good to see you tonight in the Lord's house. Good to have guests with us as well. And good to have Walter with us from Georgia and uh, training here in the Navy. I don't know how Navy gets to the middle of Utah, uh, but we got some Navy vets here tonight. So uh, be sure and greet him. Good to have you here with us uh, tonight. Don't forget about the announcements of uh, the week. Of course, Saturday is our soul winning time at 10 o'clock in the morning. Saturday night, uh, men, March 2nd. Uh, it's our prayer meeting at 8 o'clock here in the auditorium. So don't forget about that. As as well. Sunday morning, the new Sunday school class starts, and uh, so don't forget as well, Brother Dan will be starting a new series here in the auditorium, and then I'll be starting up the class again uh, for 13 weeks behind us upstairs in the admin building. Uh, so if you've signed up for that, uh, be sure to be in your place. Uh, for that, we'll still have breakfast over in the fellowship hall as normal, uh, but we'll have coffee and some refreshments over there uh, upstairs as well. Uh, for that. Then don't forget next Wednesday night. It's a little bit different coming in tonight. No teachers and workers meeting, uh, but I have to be honest with you, it's a little bit refreshing, uh, but uh, looking forward to getting back at it next Wednesday night. Don't forget, we'll be the first uh, of our monthly meeting there as we begin that, and that'll be at the regular time of 6.40. Uh, then, of course, don't forget our friend day coming up. Don't forget the flyers. There's several uh, big stack there on the welcome table. There's a big stack here uh, in the track rack. Then, of course, be filling out that uh, information card for those ones that you do invite and uh, turn those in as well. As we prepare to receive the offering later, don't forget about your prayer request list. If you have one of those, put it in the offering plate and we'll have it for our prayer time later. Brother Jordan, come and continue, please. Number 266, Jesus Never Fails, be our next Amen. song. Number 266, we'll sing all three verses. Stay seated there. Number 266.
28th through Mar May 1st, don't forget, is our annual spring revival. And in the next several weeks, I'm going to be bringing that up to you more often. And I know I've given you the dates uh, months ago, and, uh, but don't let it sneak up on you. Prepare to be here for that, especially during that Monday and Tuesday evening. And let's be faithful during some of those nights when we're normally not in church. And of course, Tuesday is that all day, uh, not all day, I guess you should say, morning service, lunch, and then back to our evening service at 7. Uh, but don't forget that April 28th on a Sunday through May 1st on the 1st and on the Wednesday night. So we're looking forward uh, to that. We had a lot of snow melt today off the roof. I think our gutters did well and I was kind of watching them throughout the day, our new gutters that we got. So praise the Lord for that. We have another project being started tomorrow, a parking pad for the bus. Uh, that way they're not parking in mud and then pulling out in the mud and tracking it all over the uh, parking lot. So a lot of projects going on. We've got different types of different areas of painting done uh, this week as well. If you're still interested, there's more to do. And if you're interested in coming up here on your own time, uh, we'll set something out for you uh, to be able to paint and do some things. But lots of work going on around the property. So let's be faithful and let's give our tithes and our offerings and uh, so we can take care of some of these things. They're all budgeted, uh, but it is nice to see them taken care of as we give and we're faithful uh, with our tithes. Let's bow for a word of prayer and we'll ask God's blessings as we receive uh, the offering this evening. Brother Chris Hare, would you lead us in prayer tonight, please? Amen. You may be seated. and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this evening. And as you find your place here, if you're able, would you stand together with me tonight? 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And do we have another one? Is that another one there? Thank you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 this evening. And uh, we're going to take an Old Testament uh, look at a New Testament problem. And really what Paul uh, writes about here, and uh, if you read a lot of Paul's epistles, and as you read throughout the New Testament, Paul will often hearken back to the Old Testament. You can imagine as he was a, a teacher, as he was a student uh, of the law, a Pharisee before he was saved, uh, he studied the Old Testament greatly. He knew the, the ins and outs of the history of, of God's people. And so with that in mind, let's begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat that same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse number 12, the Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. 
I'm going to preach a message this evening entitled, Snatching Defeat from the Jaws of Victory. Snatching Defeat from the Jaws of Victory. You'll notice in verse number, uh, beginning in verse number 6, but then especially in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, we find the word neither, 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 neither. Those really supply the outline for the message tonight of what, of what Paul was trying to get across to this local New Testament church there in Corinth. Let's bow forward to prayer as we begin the message this evening. Father, we do thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for, Lord, the uh, opportunity and the privilege that we have to have the Word of God. Uh, Lord, many of us, multiple copies. Uh, Lord, at home, sitting on shelves. Lord, we have the opportunity and privilege to read it throughout the day. Lord, I pray that now as we gather together as a, as a congregation, uh, Lord, we might collectively open our hearts and minds to the Word of God, and then you, you might speak to us as a, as a church, speak to us as a body tonight. Thank you for the Hatcher Pirate Club and the workers there in the other building. Pray that you might bless their study and bless and pray that you give light as they, as they walk in the light that they've been given. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I want to make a statement tonight, and I'll say it throughout the message, but it really is the, the central idea and the understanding of what Paul is writing here that God has given us. And the statement is this, divine privilege does not guarantee divine success. Divine privilege does not guarantee divine success. Paul is going to show this local New Testament church in Corinth an example of an assembly. And the children of Israel, they were, they were an assembly. They were a group of people. They were called out. They were visible. It was not a local New Testament church, but they, they were an assembly. So Paul is going to show this New Testament church an assembly just like themselves that had all the divine privileges in the world, but they were still judged by God. Paul is going to give them this example. Why is he giving this example to the, this church at Corinth? Well, because as we continue reading chapter number 10, they are still struggling with this issue of Christian liberty. Paul is trying to get this understanding uh, and, and where Christian liberty plays a role in their life, he's trying to get that nailed down in their life because that was, that was the struggle primarily that they had through a, a host of other things. They were still struggling and whether they should be exercising it when it still negatively affected other Christians. Remember, they had that attitude where it didn't matter and they had knowledge that they could do this and if it hurt someone else and it caused someone else to stumble, well, that's their fault. And so Paul is going to continue to drive home this understanding in this issue of Christian liberty. Now think of tonight as Paul brings the nation of Israel, this Old Testament assembly, into a New Testament, New Testament life. The nation of Israel enjoyed a great privilege from God. How? Well, he, he chronicles it here. We first of all know that they had the physical manifestations of God's guidance in the wilderness, did they not? They had the, the pillar of fire by day, and they had the, the, the cloud uh, or, or a pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day to lead them and guide them. And when that would stop, they would stop. And when it would move, it would move. And they, they set up everything they did. Their, 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 their tent, their nation was centralized around that providential guidance. They were also, the Bible tells us, under the authority. The Bible says baptized unto Moses. That is not a, a New Testament baptism in water that we think of today that is, in a, that is a symbol of our salvation. Being baptized simply means they were underneath. What were they underneath? They were underneath the authority of Moses. They were under the authority of the, of the meekest man in all the world, the Bible says. So they had that great privilege. What does the Bible also say? The Bible says they ate and experienced physical meat but physical meat that was supernaturally provided to them by God. Think about that, the manna that came, the quail that came, the other meals that God provided for not just a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but for 40 years in the wilderness, God supernaturally provided physical food for the nation of Israel. The Bible also describes there that they drank physical water supernaturally provided to them by God. When Moses struck the rock, the water poured from the rock. When, when they came to a pool of water uh, that, was, that, was, that was bitter, Moses was able to throw a tree branch in there, and that bitter water became sweet water. They were able to partake in, those, in that physical water, that sustenance that they, that they so desperately needed because of supernatural provision. The Bible also describes there they were given in that rock that was Christ, verse number four. They were given a picture of the ultimate provision 
that Christ would give when he would die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. But the very same people who enjoyed great spiritual privilege from God, that very same people also fell into apostasy away from God, and they were judged for it. Now why? Because divine privilege does not guarantee divine success. That same statement. Paul tells the church at Corinth here that God was not pleased with many of the Israelites. Verse number five. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. And what happened? They were overthrown. They were judged in the wilderness because of their, because of their apostasy, because of their turning away from God, even in, the, even in the very time that God was giving them supernatural and special uh, spiritual blessings and privileges. And tonight in the providence and the sovereignty of God, pay attention, these, these things happened to Israel. Why? Because God knew there would be a local New Testament church in Corinth that would be struggling with the same things hundreds of years later. What did Paul tell the church there? Paul said these things were for our examples. Why? To the intent that we should not do what they did, right? He says that's why they were given to us, because God knew that this church in Corinth would be struggling with these things, and they would need the Word of God, and they would need the Apostle Paul to preach and to write these things to them. The judgment of God upon the lives of the very same people he had divinely blessed in the past it was a very real thing. And can I say tonight that even still God has provided Scripture today because God in His sovereignty and God in His providence still knew that there would be a Baptist church in Salt Lake City called Anchor Baptist Church that would still be struggling with these things too. And God in His long-suffering, God in His mercy, God in His forbearance gave us these examples so that we would not face the same judgment that his people did in the Old Testament. Tonight, if you don't believe that God will, God will divinely judge the very same people he has at times divinely blessed, if you don't believe that tonight, let's look at these examples. So look at me in verse number 6. We first of all see there was wicked wants. They had wicked wants. The Bible says, Now these were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. The Bible says the children of Israel, and again, Paul is using this Old Testament example, the children of Israel were lusting after evil things. Now tonight, a student of the Old Testament will remember very quickly what these lusts were. Primarily, when he speaks of these lusts, what is he talking about? He's talking about those flesh pots of Egypt that they desired, that they longed for. Remember, they said the, uh, that, that Moses and God has led us out here into the wilderness just to, just to kill us, and oh, that we would have the, the, the flesh pots uh, of Egypt, and oh, that we would have the leeks and the garlics and the, and the onions of Egypt. And remember what God did. God, in their desire for meat, because they had had manna for so long, God, in their desire for meat, what did he do? He brought down quail. The Bible talks about that they were flying, they were flying this high where you could just simply snatch a quail and you could, just, you could just take it and, 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 and eat it right there. But what happened in the book of Numbers, while that quail, the Bible says, was in their teeth, God struck them with a plague, and many of them died. Now think about that reality for the example of the believers in Corinth. Those flesh pots in Egypt that the Israelites longed for, they were no more unclean than the, than the prime rib that had been offered to idols that the, that the ones in Corinth were wanting and they were wanting to exercise their Christian liberty over. It, it, it was really no different. But what the problem was, and tonight the source of their lust, listen tonight, church, was the lack of their satisfaction with divine provision. God had divinely provided for them manna, and the children of Israel were like two-year-olds that, 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 that thumbed their nose at God and said, we don't want that, we want something else. They were not satisfied with what God had provided for them. And because they weren't satisfied, what they do? They lust for other things. They lust for that which God had not provided as if the supernatural that God had provided wasn't enough. Tonight, this is the first step. And we're gonna, this is really a, the, the message are, 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 are steps that we go through. This is where the first step of trouble leads us in the desire to exercise our Christian liberty like this church in Corinth was in the area of wicked wants, 
and the lack of satisfaction with what God has already provided for us. God has already given us all that we need. God has already provided for us all of our, all of our, all of our needs, everything that we would, everything that we would ever, could, could ever want and could ever need, God provides for us. And yet many times the exercise, now think about this, many times the exercise of Christian liberty is a lot of times to go, and beyond, to go above and beyond what God has provided and say, I need extra, I need more, I want more. He is not enough. What he has given me is not enough. And so we exercise our Christian liberty in the area of wicked wants and the lack of satisfaction with what God has provided. So what's the exhortation? The exhortation is that God will judge the very same person, even though in the past he had blessed them, even though in the past he had supernaturally provided for them, he will judge that same person when they show a lack of satisfaction for what God has provided for them, what God has given them. I'm going to encourage you tonight as, as a church, don't let your lack of satisfaction in what God has given you cause you to exercise Christian liberty to the extent it causes someone else to stumble and then you are judged by God for it. That happens a lot. Now, I don't think we oftentimes digest that in that way. I don't think we oftentimes express it in that way. Because again, I'll go back to maybe the illustration I used with maybe the way that we, maybe the way that we talk and the language that we use. Maybe I'll go back to the illustration of how we talked about what we do on Sunday afternoons when really after the times of services when Anchor Baptist Church has decided to meet because we are, we are, we are told to be faithful to the assembly, but outside of those service times, well, we could really have the Christian liberty to do whatever we want to. And because we are not satisfied with what God has given us and maybe the Lord's day and maybe worship of God, we say, well, I've got to go fill my day with something else outside of the Lord's day and outside of worship to God. And what happens? It leads to wicked wants. It leads to lusts. And it causes maybe us to stumble, but maybe more than us, it causes someone else to stumble. God will judge the person who shows a lack of satisfaction for what he's given. Now look at the second step. We see in verse number seven, we first of all saw that there's wicked wants, but now look at wicked worship. The Bible says in verse number seven, so Paul is going to move on to another illustration still in the life of the children of Israel. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So next they were guilty of not just a lack of satisfaction, now they're guilty of idolatry. The next step of someone who snatches a, 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 really what God intends to be a life of victory and who snatches defeat from that, the next step is to substitute a graven image for a holy God. Hold your place there in 1 Corinthians and go to Exodus chapter 32. I want you to see this substitution because it's not a substitution like we think. I think sometimes we think, well, Israel, they were just, they were just bound and determined to be, to be wicked and to be bad and to be idolatrous. And they made this golden calf and they just bowed down like a bunch of pagans and, and worshipped it in, in, in every way that we would imagine. But it's more religious than that. It, it's, 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 more, it's more refined than that. It's more, it's more a substitution and a, and, a, and, a, and a bringing along with who God is rather than just an outright denial of God. I think sometimes that's why and that's how we dismiss idolatry in our life. We say, well, I'm not, I'm not the idolater in, in, in some you know, third world country that doesn't have any knowledge of God and doesn't have the King James Bible. I'm not that type of an idolater. No, that's not the only type of idolatry. Sometimes the I, I, idolatry is coupling something together with God as if it is God and hanging on to God and that at the same time. So look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Notice the Bible says we need gods to go before us. Had, God not, had not God already gone before them? So think about this. They weren't wanting these gods to do something Jehovah God was not doing. 
They were just saying, we, we, we need this to go along. We need, we need these gods that we're going to make with our hands. We need them to do what God is already doing and, and what God has done and be the, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. Then look in verse number four. And he, talking about Aaron, received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So now Aaron gives credit to the molten calf for bringing them out of Egypt. What is Aaron doing? Aaron knew good and well it wasn't a molten calf that brought them out of Egypt. It was God Jehovah that brought them out of Egypt. But what was Aaron doing? Aaron was making this molten calf, this, this golden calf, equivalent to Jehovah God. Look at verse number 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And the Lord made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. As they were setting up this molten calf, this golden calf worship, they really believed in their eyes that they were worshiping God. What had they done? They had made this golden calf and Jehovah God one in the same in their minds. They were idolatrous. They, they, they were going to have multiple gods. They weren't just trying to get rid and kick out Jehovah God. No, they were trying to add this to God. Tonight, the sin of idolatry, it can be, you know, some little, some little idol that someone carves out of wood or out of stone and sets up on their house, on their mantle, or on their, on their car dashboard. I see that sometimes and praise to that or, or trust in that for safety or whatever it might be. That can be idolatry, but fundamentally, that's not all that idolatry is. The carving of, of, of a piece of wood, that's just an outward expression. The carving of a piece of wood is just the result of the idolatry of the heart. The children of Israel considered their golden calf to be made in honor of Jehovah God. And they lifted up that golden calf literally and physically and celebrated it as what brought them freedom. Right? Celebrated it as what brought them out of Egypt, knowing full well God is the one who did it. Now, did not the Corinthian believers also celebrate their Christian liberty? Did not the Corinthian believers also celebrate their so-called freedom in Christ? As if what they were doing in sin came from Christ, right? Think of me, and think back to chapter number 5. What were they doing? They were flaunting that they were no longer under the Mosaic law, so much so that a man brought his new wife to church, and she was his father's mother, and everyone thought it was great. Everyone thought it was wonderful. Why? Because they were flaunting their new supposed liberty found in Christ, which was really sin. Is that not what the children of Israel were doing? And that's what Paul is reminding them of here. And the danger and what will be judged by God is, listen, tonight, when you and I as believers, when we give credit to and we replace God with something else, as if that is the thing that brought us to where we are right now. And many times, again, it's done in the name of, well, it's done in the name of God. It's done in the name of, uh, uh, of, spiritual, of spiritual things that, that, that God does. I, throughout the years, I've seen some people do some crazy stuff and say some crazy stuff in the name of God, right? And they'll equate that to, to what God is doing or, or, or what God has supposedly said in His Word. A holy God will not allow His name to be attached to that which is unholy without judging the people that are doing it. And it doesn't matter if those people have been divinely blessed beforehand, God will judge those same people when they are an idolatrous people. Again, so don't, don't think of idolatry only as, again, someone carving a little uh, 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 image out of a stone or wood or buying a, a little, little bale and worshiping Him. No, idolatry is when we lift up anything as... as Co-equal with God as if that thing has helped us as much as God has helped us and brought us along life's way. It could be our personality that we're lifting up. It could be our own pride. It could be our abilities. It could be our char char charisma. It could be, our, it could be our humility that we're lifting up and saying, well, I'm, I, I'm here because I was, I was humble and I knew how to handle my business. That's idolatrous. You're celebrating and you're worshiping that as if that was God. 
We see their wicked worship, but then look at verse number 8, their wicked works. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, we see in verse number 8, we get there, the Bible says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. When you have a substitution for God, even in the name of being spiritual as they did, it always leads to a lowering of morality and wicked works. Just like what we find in Exodus chapter number 32. Don't go back there, but remember when they were waiting for Moses to get back from Mount Sinai, and remember they made the golden calf and all that, all that was going on with that? Think about this. Think about the, the, the irony of it. They were waiting for their leader. They were waiting for the man of God to bring back down the law of God. They were meeting, he, Moses was meeting with God himself on the mountain, just, just, just uh, uh, feet from them. They're waiting for that, and while they're waiting for that, what are they doing? They're dancing naked to music that sounded like war. That's what they were doing. Why? Because a lowering of spirituality in what we worship always leads to a lowering of morality. And they were doing it all in the name of worshiping God. Tonight, when men, even Christians, when we substitute anything for God, the results are always the same. There's a lowering of morality. But today, people want to supposedly have and exercise morals, but they want to do it outside of God. Right? They want to exercise and they want to have morals outside of the Ten Commandments and outside of God. That's why we've seen for decades now. Right? Our public school systems, for the most part, are doing away with the Ten Commandments. Why? Because they don't want that to be the standard of morality. But there is no morality, there is no standard of morality outside of the Word of God and outside of the righteousness and holiness of God. But, but man always, when they substitute God, the results are the same. Spiritual defection always leads to moral defection. And that is, as verse number 8 tells us, that is, but it's not only the sin of fornication. It's a, it's a description there in verse number 8 of what happens when our morals have turned sides, when they've, when they've defected, when they've, when they've switched. I think of famous defectors in history. One of the most famous defectors in American history, of course, is Benedict Arnold. Right? He went from a, a colonel uh, or a general, I think, in the, in the colonial army, and he defected to the British army during the Revolutionary War. There's another man, lesser known, but uh, well cemented in history by the name of Igor Gauzenko. On September 5th, 1945, Igor Gauzenko, he had been a, an ambassador uh, from the Soviet Union to Canada uh, for years, all throughout World War II. And don't forget... The Soviet Union was part of the Allied powers in World War II. Uh, so they were fighting with, with us against the axis of evil. But he was a, an ambassador to Canada during that time. But on September 5th, 1945, so just months before the war ended, he took out 109 documents uh, from the uh, embassy there in Canada of the Soviet Union that regarded or that, that talked about Soviet spy activities in the Western Hemisphere. He defected. He said, I'm no longer going to be part of the Soviet Union. I'm now, I'm now uh, laying out all of this Soviet spy activity in the Western Hemisphere. While we're supposed to be allies with the Western Hemisphere, I'm laying it all out there and I'm changing sides. What he did there is many times uh, credited with starting the, the Cold War. A defection is turning from one side to the other. Tonight, when we lack self-control and we exercise our liberty, our Christian liberty, indiscriminately, right? Think about the local New Testament aspect of it in 1 Corinthians. When we exercise our Christian liberty indiscriminately and we don't think about whether, number one, it's truly edifying, does it really build me up in Christ? Number two, does it glorify God? And number three, we don't think about, does it make another brother in Christ stumble and make them emboldened in their conscience to go and sin themselves? When we don't think about those three things, what does it do? It eventually leads to the defection of our spirituality, a, a coldness, a callousness of our spirituality, which then leads to a defection of our morals. It really, it, it changes us. 
it, it fundamentally changes us who we are. Again, you think with me, an example, what we do on the Lord's Day outside of our service times, what we do in our entertainment, what we talk about, how we act, how we joke, what we do for pleasure, all of these things that we are exercising Christian liberty in, if they are not guided by those three principles, do they edify, does it glorify God, and might it cause someone else to stumble? If it's not guided by that, what happens? My spiritual mind, my spirituality is defective. It's turned. It switches sides. And then what happens? It's not long before you see somebody's morality defected. And their morality, what they would say at one time they would never ever do, what do you find? Oh, they're no longer just practicing Christian liberty. They're now in full-blown sin. And not only are they just doing whatever they want to do on the Lord's Day uh, during their maybe quote-unquote free time, they are doing whatever they want to do on the Lord's Day during church service times. And, and, and that, again, that's just an example. But everything else they want to do, why? Because they have, they have defected. But tonight, what turns, what dictates our morals today? Many times what dictates our morals today is what we see on TV. It, it changes us. You watch enough TV long enough, you just take the, the shows that they're putting out today, the cartoons that they're putting out today. Right? I, was, I was away from it for a little bit, but since having a, a, a great, we see, man, there's many things that they are putting in television and many things they're putting in children's movies today. What are they doing? They're trying to, to change morals. Right? It, it's fundamental. It, it's, not, it's not accident. It's not just play. It, 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 it's a purposeful act that's being done. Many times what dictates our morals is public advertising, right? We see billboards, we see signs, we see advertising. We say, oh, I didn't know that's cool to do today, so I'm going to start doing that today. What has it done? It has dictated who we are. It's, it's, it's changing our morals. Social media does that. The public school system for years has driven what the morals of, of, of society and our young people are today. So when we're so... Think about this. when we're so into my rights, when we're so into my Christian liberties, we soon will defect from the Bible as the standard of morals, as the standard of morality. And what do we find? We find our standard is now, again, TV, the public school system, public advertising, social media, whatever it is. That then becomes our morality and our standard instead of the Word of God. We, we, we defect to the side of what the world dictates, and we don't even know it. That very thing happened. Again, Paul, we won't take time to turn there, but Paul is telling them something that they, that they most likely knew about because he, he, he brings it up, and I don't think if they hadn't have known about it, he wouldn't have brought it up. But in Numbers chapter 25, God judged and killed over 20,000 Israelites for their moral defection. They had begun marrying and they had begun intermarrying with, with all kinds of, uh, of heathen, idolatrous nations. And they were defecting from spiritually what God had them to be, and they were defecting then in their morals of what God wanted them to be. And God killed 20,000 of them for that defection. It wasn't until Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, threw a javelin through a man and a woman's heart and stopped the plague that God was was judging Israel with. We see verse number nine. Fourthly, we see now wicked ways. Wicked ways. The Bible says, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Oh, think back to the brazen serpent, right? That's lifted up. That's what he's talking about. That was lifted up in the wilderness that they were to look. Look and live. My brother live. Look and live. Look to Jesus, which was a picture of that. Look to Jesus now and live. But this next step down is now the tempting of, the tempting of Christ in, in wicked ways. Go with me to Psalm 78, the book of Psalms in chapter 78. And we'll see a little bit of what, what Paul is referring to when we talk about tempting Christ. What does it mean to tempt Christ? Is the Bible saying that we are like the devil in Matthew chapter 4, and we go take Jesus somewhere out in the wilderness and we tempt him to do something that he doesn't want to do. Is that what tempting Christ means? Well, Paul talks about it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that they were guilty of it, but he refers them back to here Psalm 78, verse number 19. Psalm 78, verse number 19, the Bible says, Yea, they spake against God, 
What'd they say? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Look at verse number 21. Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Tempting God tonight is not goading God to sin. Tempting God is not, is not provoking Him maybe to some action that's outside of His character. Right? And we say, well, I, I, I tempted God and He wasn't going to do this, but, but I provoked Him and he, he went ahead and did that. But God is not little like us. God is not small like us in that way. God doesn't tempt us with sin. The Bible says, neither tempted He any man with sin. Tempting God then, what is it? It has the understanding of, of skepticism, of what God can do or of how God can work. Tempting God is literally drawing a circle around God and saying one or two things. You have to work in here. You have to work inside of what I want you to do. You have to work inside of, of, of my parameters and of my will and of my desires. So it's that part of it. But then the other aspect of it, of tempting God, is saying that circle's there, and I don't believe you can do anything outside of that circle. That's tempting God. It's literally drawing that circle and saying you can only, or you have to only, work in this area. In Numbers chapter 21, Israel tempted God in that they were skeptical as to whether or not God would judge them for their sins. They were murmuring, they were complaining about the lack of food. They were murmuring, they were complaining about their leadership. They didn't believe, as we read in Psalm 78, that God could provide a table for them in the wilderness. And they even accused God of bringing them out into the wilderness simply to, to die and to kill them. And so God, the Bible says, not being tempted, what did he do? He sent serpents to bite them. Tonight, are you skeptical of what God can do, or are you limiting God as to what areas you're telling Him He has to work? You say, I thought these were God's people. He, he, he sends snakes to kill them? Yes, again, because remember, divine privilege does not guarantee divine success. When we choose to sin, God will choose to judge the sin. When we choose to exercise Christian liberty that does not edify, does not bring God glory, hurts other people, God will judge our sin just like He did the children of Israel in the wilderness. When our ways are wicked and we tempt God, God sees that. Well, tonight as God's people, may, 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 we, may we be mindful to not provoke the forbearance of God and, and, and not expect judgment at the same time. When we do, what does Paul say? Paul says, that was for our example, remember the fiery serpents. Anytime we're tempted to put God in a box and, says, and say, God, you've got to work here or you, you can't do anything outside of this box, remember the fiery serpents. Remember them in the wilderness. God judged his people for tempting him and saying he can't provide a, a table in the wilderness. Then look in verse number 10, we see number five. We now find wicked words. The Bible says, Neither murmur ye, have some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And tonight, when a Christian begins to murmur, we have really, really, we've reached a new low in our, our walk. I was going to say our walk with God, but our walk away from God. Murmuring implies a total rejection of, of God's leadership in our life. Of course, remember the illustration, the Old Testament illustration that Paul is referring to is Israel's rejection of Moses and Aaron as their God-given leadership. And, and who brought about that? Korah. Remember Korah and his rebellion against Moses and Aaron? And what did God do? God said, Korah and all your people stand over there. Moses and everybody else, get over there. And I, I imagine they got as far away as they could. And what happened? The whole earth opened up and swallowed Korah and the whole rebellion. For, their, for, for what? Well, ultimately, for their standing against Moses, but what brought about the standing against Moses? It was the murmuring. It was, it, was, it was the murmuring. Now, think of the Corinthians' attitude toward their leadership. 
we don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us who their, who their pastor was, but we know that they were rebellious against Paul's authority in their life, even so much so that they begin to even question whether Paul was even apostle or not, to the point that he has to defend himself. And normally that's not something Paul would do, defend uh, who he was and what God had called him to do, but it, it had gotten that bad. In 1 Corinthians 3.9, Paul tells the church, essentially, he says, look in 1 Corinthians 3.9, just a few verses back. He says, for we are labors together. Paul saying, me, me and you. We are labors together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. What is Paul saying? Paul is essentially saying, we are in this together with God. We're serving God together. We're, 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 we're fellow, we're, 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 we're yoke fellows. What did Jesus say? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Paul was saying, we're, 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 we're yoke fellows. We're in this together with God. So don't fight against those who are leading you. Don't fight against those who are working together with you. The traveling of the children of Israel, when you read through Numbers, it was marked by murmuring everything. Murmuring means to say things in a low tone. They complained, they criticized, and they grumbled about everything that God did for them. When God brought them out of Egypt from 400 years of slavery, mumble, mumble, mumble. When God provided for them spiritual, heavenly food, mumble, mumble, mumble. When God provided for them water, mumble, every single thing they, they murmured and complained about. Think about that. All that God did for them and provided for them was met with murmuring. And so what did God do? He judged them. God judged, get this, He judged the very same people that He spiritually fed, that He spiritually led, and watered. Why? Because divine privilege does not equal divine success. In other words, just because God has blessed you just because God has worked in, in your life in the past does not mean that God will ignore the sins of today. That's what Paul was getting across to these Corinthian believers here. Paul repeat, repeats the fact that these things happened to Israel. Look in verse number 11. He, he says it again. He repeats the fact that these things happened to Israel to do what? To serve as an example, to serve as a warning of what the Corinthian believers should not do, especially in these last days. Now look in verse number 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed, lest he fall. All of these reminders from Israel's past are for the Christian tonight. Are for the members and the people gathered together in this place called Anchor Baptist Church. These reminders are for the Christian who believes that they're strong. These reminders are for the Christian who believes that we can exercise our Christian liberty at times at the expense of weaker believers. This is for the strong Christians who tend to say, well, if they're stumbling at what I'm doing, they need to mature. This is for the quote-unquote strong Christian that would say, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal if I, if I do that. I've got perfect liberty to do that. This is for the Christian. This warning is for the Christian that says, no one watches what I do. No one, no one considers me as their, as their example. What does the Bible say? Take heed lest you fall. Not fall from salvation. And, and not, even, not even as we often like to interpret this. Not even fall from a place of pride down to humility. Or from a place of strength down to, down to weakness. That's not even what it's talking about. But what is the Bible talking about when it says... Take heed lest you fall. It's talking specifically about suffering the judgment of God. When the Israelites fell in the wilderness, they didn't just you know, stumble and trip and fall. When the Bible says that they fell, what'd they, what happened? They were judged by God. They, they, they weren't just going from a, a, a place of pride down to humility or a place of strength down to weakness. They were literally judged by God for what they had done in their life against God. Verse number five tells us, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Overthrown by what? By God's judgment. Tonight, the understanding and the warning is this. 
God does not turn a blind eye, not just a, and, and here's, here's, here's it, it's personal, and, it, and it, it's specific. God does not turn a blind eye just to our sin, but what's the issue? God does not turn a blind eye to the misuse of our Christian liberty, even when we exercise it without regard to how it affects others, God still notices. And what does He say? Take heed. You're going to be judged. Take heed. God is not going to allow that to continue when you don't consider whether or not what you do glorifies God. And when you don't consider whether or not what you do causes someone else to stumble and, and, and fall in their Christian life. When you don't consider what you do, whether or not it edifies. The children of Israel should have experienced Great victory. In fact, it was, it was theirs for the taking. Right? They had everything, everything imaginable at their disposal. But they managed somehow to live in defeat. Their life was absent of the self-control that we found in chapter number 9 when Paul talks about keeping under his body and keeping it in subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should also be a castaway. Self-control was absent in their life in this area of Christian liberty, and they, they weren't living for the gospel's sake. Verse 23 of chapter 9. And so their life was marked by what? Wicked wants, wicked worship, wicked ways, wicked work, wicked words, and they fell to God's judgment. Tonight there's a temptation in all of us to ignore the warnings like this in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 10, simply because of, I, I think like they did, because of past blessings. And we think to ourselves, God, I'm not going to be judged like that today. And we think, you know, how God is not going to do that. And it's all based upon, I'm doing okay. I, I've got spiritual privileges right now. We may not use those words, but that's what, we're, that's what we've convinced ourselves of. Things are fine. I, I'm not going to face any type of judgment of God. Learn the lesson like that God will judge sin, regardless of who we are and regardless of what He's done in the past in our life. God will not ignore the exercise of our Christian liberty when it hurts someone else, when it does not really spiritually edify us, and when it doesn't bring glory to God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, may we not be blind, Lord, to the, to the fact of what we've emphasized over and over tonight, that divine privilege does not guarantee divine success. Lord, in the day and age in which we live in 2024, Lord, we are, we are so privileged as God's people. We have the Word of God. We have hindsight. We have history of how you've worked. Lord, many in here tonight have a, have a Christian heritage. Lord, we have, we have so many uh, divine privileges that, that should relate to, to spiritual victories. But many times we manage to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize tonight many times it comes because we have a misunderstanding like Israel did and like the church at Corinth did that we are going to have success just because we have past privileges spiritually. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to Get our Christian liberty in check tonight. Lord, I pray that everything we do might be measured by, does it glorify you? Does it really edify? And could it cause someone else to stumble? If not, Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to stop the direction we're going. Help us to stop the, the wicked way in which we're going until it might come to the judgment of God. I pray that you'd help us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together tonight as heads are bowed and eyes are closed. However God has spoken to your heart tonight, however the Holy Spirit has dealt with you, whatever your need is. You say, I find one of these areas of wickedness in my life. Be wicked ways or works or words or worship, whatever it might be. I find it in my life where I'm, I'm not very attuned to how I'm using my Christian liberty. The blacks and whites of the Bible, I'm, I, I, I'm clear on those things. I'm, I, I, I fall right on the side of God. But in matters of doubtful areas in the Word of God, I don't often check it by those three parameters. 
So because of that, what I find, I find myself spiritually defecting and I find my morals defecting. I, I find changing in my life because I'm not following the Word of God. I'm not under control, under Spirit's control. God is speaking to your heart tonight. Would you come? Avoid the judgment that God will judge His people by.